Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Oxford Online Maths Club. My name's James and excitingly I'm joined today by Flora. Hi. <laughs> um, Flora's a current student at Oxford. Flora, what, what year are you in and what college are you at? I'm in second year. I'm studying maths at Mansfield College. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, it's almost like we scripted this bit. Um, <laughs> joining us, um, also joining us in chat um, below are a couple more um, current students. We have Jonah uh, and Beth um, joining us in chat as well today. Um, Beth's been around in chat quite a few times before. I think Flora's, you've been in chat as well, haven't you? I have, yes. Yeah. Answering you might questions. Have met me on chat. <laughs> chatting to the students. Um, I think it's Jonah's first time along. Everyone say hi to Jonah. Uh, Jonah with an H. Um, yes, okay, and if you want to join chat, um, that's over at slido.com uh, slash OOMC. Um, and chat appears live on screen. Anything you say will be moderated and may appear live on an Oxford live stream uh, underneath my face. Um, okay, uh, someone says I'm avoiding questions on Arbor Prize, and it's true that um, while we were setting up the live stream, loads of difficult questions about the Arbor Prize came in. Um, people <laughs> want to talk about the Arbor Prize. I haven't been following the news on the Arbor Prize. I'm really sorry, everyone. Um, I understand it's just been awarded to someone, and I haven't been following the news. Um, so I haven't answered questions in, in chat on in that. Uh, cool. Ah, someone's done the chain rule recently. That's exciting. Hi, I'm going to say hi to Rebecca. Hi to an anonymous person, which reminds me that people in the Slido chat can be anonymous. Um, you don't have to put your name there. Um, and someone has put, hey, Flora, in capital letters. Possibly Aww. a Flora fan. Right, OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> and just to follow that up, someone with the username E has appeared and said the letter E. Uh, and nothing else. Right. Um, so what are we doing today? <laughs> what are we doing today, Flora? Today, uh, I'm going to be talking about something called topology, um, which is a topic in maths, which I really like. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so Flora's got some slides on uh, slides on topology. Um, I'm going to let Flora go through slides. I'm going to let you start talking in a moment, I promise. Um, yeah, I just want to stress. <laughs> um, we're going to go through some stuff. We're going to try and talk to people in chat as we go through. Um, I'm keeping an eye on chat. Um, you might see me typing on one side as I try and talk to chat at the same time. I'm also listening. <laughs> um, and there'll be further reading afterwards. Um, the way this works is we do a bit of maths live. Um, and then afterwards, um, we post some sort of further reading or bits if you want to follow stuff up on the Maths Club website, which is maths.org.uk slash r slash club. And it's down there below somewhere as well. OK, over to you, Flora, I think. <laughs> Great. So uh, I'm Flora. I'm a second year mathematician at Mansfield College, Oxford. And this is an introduction to topology. So first and foremost, what is topology? Well, it's... Um, a subject which studies shapes and spaces, but without worrying about things like distance and angles. Um, so it's kind of like geometry, but in my opinion, it's cooler. Um, now, in topology, we can stretch, twist, crumple and bend objects without changing their main structure. So it doesn't change the main key features that we're interested in if we stretch or bend things without breaking them. So a key thing that I will say is you can bend, but you can't break. Um, the formal definition is, it's a study of properties of a geometric object that are preserved under continuous deformations. So it's about shapes and spaces and it's fun and useful because it has applications in areas such as biology, computer science, physics, robotics, and also games and puzzles like entanglement puzzles. So a key concept in topology is the idea of <laughs> spaces which are homeomorphic to each other. Uh, now, what does homeomorphic mean? Um, the word homeomorphic comes from Greek words homeos, meaning similar or the same, and morph, meaning shape or form. Um, so it means like the same form. So two things are homeomorphic if they are the same, apart from bending and squishing, basically. Now, there is like a proper rigorous mathematical definition of what homeomorphic means, um, but it's a bit complicated. So I will include that in the further reading if you're interested and you want to read up on some definitions. Um, and just a side note about spaces, when I say a space in topology, it can be general, it can mean anything like a line or a table or a person or, you know, a sphere. Um, so I take this word space really generally, you can have any, anything could be a topological, topological space really. Um, so like I said, to make something into a thing that's homeomorphic to it, we can bend and stretch it, but don't break it. Um, 
And a common mathematical joke is that a topologist can't tell the difference between a mug and a donut. And this is because a mug and a donut are homeomorphic. And now you can see from this uh, animation at the side that here we've got a donut and then it kind of stretches out and bends a bit and becomes a mug. And the key point here is that both the mug and the donut only have one hole going through them and therefore they are homeomorphic. Now, if we had a soup bowl like this with two handles, um, that would not be homeomorphic to a donut because no matter what you do, you can't squish or stretch this soup bowl to make it donut because it has two holes. So it's not homeomorphic to a donut. There's some discussion in chat about whether you can fit tea into that mug as depicted. <laughs> you can, only when it's in that form. Now, if you're going to, you know, if you're making it out of some kind of squishy plasticine and then you're going to squish it into a donut, the tea will indeed fall out. And I wouldn't recommend, you know, trying that. Um, like the property of being able to put tea in it is not not preserved. Under, under, <laughs> under homeomorphism, homeomorphism. That's, that's very very true. You know, you can have something that's flat and homeomorphic to something that is definitely not flat. So holding liquid is a no no in terms of yeah homeomorphisms. <laughs> so now I'm going to talk about something interesting, um, which we can think of as mathematical glue. Now in topology, it's actually called equivalence relations and quotient spaces. But basically, we're going to use these mathematical structures in order to glue topological spaces together. So firstly, some definitions. Um, an equivalence relation is a thing that we do to a space. We decide which points are equivalent to each other. So you take some points and you say, I'm going to say that these points are equivalent. And then they will be in an equivalence class. Equivalence class means a group of points which are equivalent to each other. So for example, if we took this oval, um, we could say, well, here's a group of points. I'm going to say they're all equivalent to each other. Here's another group of points. I'm going to say they're all equivalent to each other. So every point will be in exactly one equivalence class. And then uh, some points could be a singleton equivalence class. That means that there's just one point which is only equivalent to itself and not equivalent to anything else. Um, and then we can take the quotient space. And what that means is, we glue the equivalent points together. So the equivalent points, the points that we said were all in the same equivalence class, become the same point. Now, you might still be a bit confused, but this makes a lot more sense when we look at an example. So I'm going to uh, keep those definitions in the corner in case you missed them. But we're going to look at an example. So here I have a line. Now, you can think of it as like a segment of the real line of real numbers, a number line from 0 to 1. But that doesn't really matter in topology. All we care about is the fact that it's a line. Um, and remember, it could be a bendy line or a bit of a zigzaggy line. As long as it's a line with just two endpoints which are joined together, these three lines are all homeomorphic to each other. So we just care that it's a line. And I'm going to define an equivalence relation on this line. And the equivalence relation is, uh, the two endpoints are equivalent to each other. So one equivalence class consists of the two endpoints. And then every other point is a singleton equivalence class, which means it's only equivalent to itself. So it's not going to get glued to anything else. So like I said, we can bend this line round. This bendy line is still homeomorphic to the original line. So they're equivalent in a topological sense. And then the two endpoints are going to get glued together. When we take the quotient space, the equivalent points get glued together. Ta-da! It's a circle. <laughs> um, so kind of intuitively, it makes sense that if we had some mathematical glue, we can get a line and bend it round to glue it together and make it a circle. And now it's joined up. So now we can uh, do much cooler things if we start with a square instead of a line. Um, and now thinking about it, a square doesn't really matter that it's actually a square. It could be a rectangle. In terms of topology, a rectangle is homeomorphic to a square because we can easily just stretch it out. So I've started with a square, but it could have been wider. It doesn't matter. Um, and now we're going to define an equivalence relation on this square. And I'm going to say every point inside the square in the interior is going to be a singleton equivalence class by itself. It's not equivalent to anything. And then the edges, we're going to kind of match up like this. So you see, I've labeled the top and the bottom edges A with an arrow going that way. And the side edges I've labeled B with arrows going upwards. 
And what this means is the top, every point on the top edge is in an equivalence class with a point on the bottom edge. So like this point is equivalent to this point. An equivalence class is that point with that point. And this point up here at the end of the B arrow would be equivalent to that point at the end of the B arrow. So if we want to take the quotient space, which means gluing the equivalent points together, we're going to have to imagine that this uh, square or rectangle is made of a kind of bendy piece of paper, which we can stretch and bend round to join up the equivalent points and glue them together. And I have an animation that will do that for us. So here we have a rectangle. It bends round and glues up the A edges, and then it bends round and glues up the B edges like that. And it does it backwards as well to show you how it came from this square. So just a square and a bit of mathematical glue, we can actually make a donut, which in topology is called a torus, which is a hollow donut, which is quite interesting. Um, so now I'm going to show you another cool shape which we can make from just a rectangle and some mathematical glue. And this is one of my favourite ones. So our equivalence relation here is actually really simple. We're going to say every point on this rectangle is a singleton equivalence class which doesn't get glued to anything apart from the left edge and the right edge. And we will identify every point on the left with a point on the right. Uh, except you have to be careful here and look at the arrows. Um, because this arrow is going the opposite way to that one. So a point that we reach by going upwards on the left edge will be equivalent to the point that we reach by going downwards on the right edge like this. So this point will be equivalent to that point. And then the point at the end of this arrow would be equivalent to the point at the end of this arrow like that. So in terms of uh, forming the quotient space and gluing it together, I'm actually going to show you. <laughs> so <laughs> I have got a rectangle. Now, this is obviously longer than the one that's on the screen um, and thinner, perhaps. But remember, all we've done is stretch it out. So this is homeomorphic to the rectangle that you can see on the screen. And James. <laughs> so here you go. We you agreed can see that more easily and now. I forgot to do it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's OK. So you can see here, here's an arrow, here's an arrow, and they're pointing opposite ways. So what I'm going to do is I need to make sure I twist it so that the arrows match up. And then you see here, we're gluing the equivalent points together. And you can try this at home with some scissors and some tape, which I did. And here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, so you can see here, I matched up the arrows. And now here's an animation of someone else doing it, if you don't believe me. Uh, <laughs> and now you can see what we have is called a Mobius strip. You might have seen this before, um, but it's interesting to see the way it's formed. So um, now I'm going to claim that this Möbius strip, this interesting kind of surface that I've made, only has one side. It only has one face. And that might confuse you at first, because you might be thinking, well, OK, Flora, I can look at it now. and I can see there's two sides of this piece of paper. There's that side and there's that side, right? If I can turn it over and see the other side. But actually, how do we... Uh, think about sides or faces in maths, what you have to do is imagine that you are a little ant standing on the surface and you are walking along and you're not allowed to go over an edge. You just have to keep walking along the surface. And now if you can, everywhere you can reach just by walking along the surface is on the same face. If you're not going to go over an edge, you're still on the same face. And if you were to get a pen and draw a line all the way around this band, you would get back to where you started without going over the edge. And this animation shows that. So this ball is staying, touching the Möbius strip all of the time, and it goes all the way around and then gets back to where it started, which shows that it only has one side, which is quite cool. I'm going to let, can we let the animation flat? I think it, is the live stream laggy? Is that working? Is it, is it oh. laggy? It's all right on my screen. I'm a little bit worried. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, I'll I let it play to... for oh. a bit, <laughs> so they'll get to see it at some point. <laughs> we've got a we've got a a couple of things in chat that I wanted to bring up. 
Somebody said it yeah, looks like the um, it looks like the UKMT logo, which is true. It looks like the UKMT yeah, logo. Yeah, it does. Um, also, um, what's the there's like a there's like a triangle version with um, kind of a kind of twisted triangle shape that I've seen on like a some fashion logo. Uh, animation's oh, working, says Lucy. That's good. Uh, it's a oh, great animation. <laughs> um, and somebody asked asked um, is the quotient space of a surface not homeomorphic to the original surface and i think it's not necessarily homeomorphic to the original surface no and i can talk about this in terms of like a square when we did the torus on this slide so if you look at the space we started with um it is just a rectangle the quotient space is it depends on the equivalence relation that we defined so things get glued together and it's not the same it's not the same topologically as the, the square that we started with because the donut has a hole <laughs> the square doesn't have a hole that's the simplest way of thinking of it yeah and i think this this chat message is good as well um someone's just said is a is a square topologically equivalent to a torus and the, the answer is kind of yes if you glue the edges together in the right way um if you if you glue the edges like this um y yeah you you can you know, just take an equivalence relation, quotient space it out, and then, then yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> I was talking about Penrose tiles. What's this called? It. It's called a Penrose tile. No, um, Penrose triangle. I should have remembered it because it's ah, got Penrose in the name. I see. I think I might have heard of that. Yeah. I see them everywhere. Anyway, sorry. Um, it's <laughs> okay. Terribly interrupted. Mobius strips. Great. <laughs> yeah. No. T totally. That was interesting. So um, now we're gonna have some further adventures with the Mobius strip. <laughs> so. I'm going to say, what if, like I said, I got a pen and kind of drew a line like halfway along this strip and went all the way round and kept going. What if we cut down that line? If you, you can try this at home. Uh, if you get some scissors, you cut halfway along and then you cut all the way around. I'm not about to do it live because it might go horribly wrong, but here is one that I prepared before the live stream. <laughs> When you cut all the way around, what you get is this. And if you don't believe me, fe please feel free to, you know, make a Mobius strip at home. Um, and now you might be a bit surprised by this because you might expect two things, but this is one thing. Um, and kind of links to the idea that the Mobius strip only has one side. So when you cut it in half, you get one thing. And this actually has four twists in, whereas the original one had one twist in. And if you want to know about why that is, it's kind of complicated, but there's going to be a video in the further readings, going to be a link to a video lecture that tells you all about that. Um, and then you might wonder, well, OK, we cut it down the middle. We got one big loop instead of two things, which is quite interesting. What happens if we cut it down the middle again? So if I got the scissors and cut like this and then cut all the way around until I get back to the start. Well, what actually happens is this. <laughs> and this is this is kind of hard to look at but i'll separate it out so you can see um there's two things two bands which are linked together and they're linked like this in the middle and uh, if you actually kind of count it round each of these also has four twists um and so it's pretty amazing that now you do get two things and they're interlinked i can't possibly separate them and if you want to think about why that is as well, you can you can sit and draw some diagrams and think about it yourself. But I'd encourage you to look at the further reading as well when that comes out and um, see the lecture and how that's done. We've got other suggestions. Oh, yeah, no, show them this one. Show them this one. Hang on, I'll yeah. put your slides back up. How do I put your slides back? It's OK. Oh, there we go. Slides. Yeah, show them this one. <laughs> so, yeah, slides. An extra suggestion is what if you cut it a third of the way along? So what I mean is, like, if you have a Mobius band and then you know draw a line that's like a third from the edge and then you like cut around that line and keep going um eventually it feels like you cut around it twice because you kind of cut a third along and then you kind of come back cutting along the two thirds along line if that makes sense because when you go around a Mobius band because of the one side twist thing you come back on the other side and eventually you will join up with where you started but what will you come out with? Will it be one thing? Will it be two things? Will it be three things? Who knows? But I encourage you to try that at home and think about why that happens. And that, some of that's also in the further reading. Um, 
I love chat so much. Chat has got two more suggestions of things to try at home. Um, somebody asks, oh, yeah? what happens if you cut a Mobius band, um, if, if you have more twists in your Mobius band? I think someone's suggesting, what if you have one and a half yes. twists and then cut that, yes. what happens? Um, and Bethan asks, can you keep cutting it in half? I think Bethan said that just before you suggested cutting it in half again. So then the question is, yeah. what happens if you keep going? Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you cut it in half again, you get two things. And then you could, in theory, cut each of these in half again as well. Um, <sighs> Which is going to get difficult if you didn't start with a particularly thick piece of paper. But, you know, chop up an A4 piece of paper. Go wild, you know. People have got predictions in chat, and I think we should not say whether they're right or not. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it. It's, it's a fun thing to try. It's really amazing, Like, because I didn't know what happened when you cut it in half, and I tried it myself, and I was like, oh, and then I researched it. <laughs> Um, I guess, yeah, we showed them quite quickly what happens when you cut in half and cut in half again. But probably part of the fun of that is do it yourself at home. Try cutting a mobile yeah. strip down the middle. See what happens. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, lo loads more you can do. Try cutting it dis distances that are different from a half or a third, a smaller distance or a bigger distance and see what happens. <laughs> Shall I head on? Yeah, let's do this one. So this is... I guess a point again, sorry, just to do the point in chat that it's fine. Um, people are saying sort of is a rectangle, is a is this thing homeomorphic to the other thing? And lots of the, lots of the people I'm answering in chat, I'm saying, sure, those things are homeomorphic if you pair the edges up in the right way. You've shown us one yes. way to pair the edges up and get a torus. Um, and we're going to we're going to see, I guess, this other thing. Something there. else. Yeah. But what I will say is, you know, we formed two different things from a rectangle and they were not homeomorphic to each other once we'd done different identifications you know once you've got a mervius band and then you've got a torus which is a hollow donut they're not the same thing okay so you can make even weirder things um from just a rectangle into mathematical glue so this one has a an equivalence relation that's actually quite similar to the one for the torus um, except this time the B arrows are going in opposite directions. So the top arrow is going along to the right, the bottom arrow is going along to the left. So if we look at how points identify with each other, every point inside is still a singleton, but won't get glued to anything. And then on the edges, this point will get identified with that point. You know, every point uh, going along the top edge will get identified with the corresponding point going along the bottom edge in the other direction. And uh, in terms of matching it up, clearly we're going to have to kind of match up the A edges and then do some kind of clever twist to match up the B edges. And I can't show you this with paper. There's a reason for that. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to show you this animation, which does it for me, and then we're going to talk about that a bit. So it's quite fast, but what you notice is that joining up the A edges, the pink ones to begin with, is okay, that kind of well, not the pink one, sorry. It joins up like that. It's fairly simple. And then it bends round. And the point of going round in this loop is that the bottom kind of circle of the tube has to twist so that it the arrows match up when it joins with the top one. And this is called the Klein bottle. If you look at it, you think, well, it looks kind of a bit like a bottle if a bottle was like a two-dimensional topological surface. Um, <laughs> I... And what you will notice from this animation, perhaps, is it seems to cross over itself. Like when it goes back up to the top to join up, it like, you know, crosses over. And you're thinking, how can a space just go through itself like that? Well, the actual reason for that is that we're trying to embed the Klein bottle in 3D space, which isn't actually possible. Um, now, it embeds nicely in 4D space just fine. Uh, but sadly, it's really hard for us to uh, visualize things in dimensions higher than three. Uh, but what we can do is try and visualize the fourth dimension as time. So I'm showing you an animation now um, in which the fourth dimension is time. And what that means is that um, you're showing different parts of the Klein bottle at different times. So you can understand here that it doesn't actually cross over itself because it's never in the same place at the same time. Other ways people have of trying to visualize the fourth dimension are color. So if you have a kind of illustration of the Klein bottle where the bits that touch are different colors, then you can kind of remember that actually they're not touching because different color means in a different place in the fourth dimension. 
Um, <laughs> someone in chat, people in chat find this this gif of the climb bottle thing fa- vaguely disturbing. I think it's the colours. <laughs> I think it's the colours and the way it swells. Uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and the way it doesn't fit in 3D. Um, somebody, um, somebody being clever in chat has pointed out that you're actually trying to embed it in 2D to get it onto your slide. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. The, the animation, the animation is a 2D representation of a 3D object. You you can try and embed it in 3D space. You can make people blow a climb bottle out of glass in 3D. And so it's as good as we can get in 3D space. And then once you have a 3D climb bottle made of glass, you can actually try and fill it with water. You, if you Google videos of this, you'll find people like filling a climb bottle with water and tipping it up cleverly and stuff. And obviously that is still a 3D embedding. But yeah, we, we are trying to embed it in 2D space, kind of. So I suppose it's sort of weird that... So I think somebody in chat said, what's a climb bottle? And I suppose the, the best answer is, that's a climb bottle. <laughs> yeah, at the that's end it. of the animation, when it joins up, like, I don't know how to get it to stay still, but at the end of the animation, when it joins up, that is a climb bottle. But that's... then this animation on the right, that's showing it at different points in time, equally, that is a climb bottle. I mean, in the little bottom right here, you can see the gray one, which is staying still, helpfully. <laughs> that is what a climb bottle looks like when you try and embed it in 3D space. Yeah, I think it's kind of weird. I mean, people have already called that shape weird and disturbing. But it's it is weird. It's odd that when you pair up, if you pair up the sides in one way, you get a nice friendly donut shape um, that fits yeah. in 3D. Everyone can look at it very nicely and it doesn't terrify any physicists. Um, but if you flip <laughs> one of the arrows, if you flip one of the arrows, then the way yeah. you roll it up, there's no way to roll it up nicely in 3D without it going th- without it intersecting itself. Um, and really, yeah. the shape kind of happily lives in four dimensions. Um, we can't really show you. Yeah, that. It's, it's mad, really, how how weird it is just from changing the equivalence relation that little bit. Um, yeah, so I, and that shows you've shown now a, like a different way of sticking the edges together it gives you a completely different yeah. object. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. Think so you... we've done. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> It's okay, I was just going to say, we've done a few things with a rectangle now. It shows you that, like, there's amazing things you can do with just a rectangle. Um, the next thing is even more ambitious. <laughs> Should I head on? So, I've actually covered the title with a spoiler alert box because I think it might be quite an exciting surprise. Um, <laughs> here we have an octagon. Now, this is a regular octagon as you will hopefully recognize from like GCSE math or whatever. Um, but equally, we could have used an irregular octagon because any kind of octagon would be homeomorphic to this. Um, so just bearing in mind, remember we're allowed to bend and stretch it and it would still be homeomorphic to the original shape. Uh, so I'm gonna define a equivalence relation on this octagon and all of the points inside the octagon are gonna be a singleton equivalence class, which is only equivalent to itself, and then the, we identify the edges like this. Some people like letters for this. Some people like uh, colours. So I've used both to make it clear. But the important part here is the arrows. So the arrows going this way and that way. So I'll give some examples of points which match up. So this one is like at the end of an A arrow. So it'll match with this one that's the end of an A arrow. This one's the start of a C arrow. So it will match up with this one that's the start of a C arrow. I'm just bearing in mind there might be a delay between my laser pointer and my speaking, but hopefully you kind of understand my meaning here. Um, so you're thinking, how on earth are you going to match this up? Well, I'm not going to do it with paper in front of you like I did with the movie span, that's for sure. Um, you're going to have to bend and stretch the octagon quite a bit in order to match these up. And um, there's an amount of animation I found on a French topology website. Now, I don't speak much French at all. Um, but it doesn't matter because this website has some amazing animations on with, with no words, just animation. Um, and I'm going to include it in the further reading. I encourage you to click on it, even if you don't speak any French, because the videos are really cool. So here we are. I'll move the laser pointer out of the way. Recollement d'un octagon. <laughs> exactly. While it's so playing. First... Oh, good. No, sorry, good. <laughs> So I'm just going to talk through it a bit. So like first, it's kind of bending it. As long as we remember that we have these edges, we're allowed to bend and stretch it. And so they just use colors and arrows. And so here we're kind of bending it into kind of bowl shape. But remember, we still just had like a 2D surface. We just bent it into a bowl shape. 
and made some of the edges longer, some of them shorter. But remember, distance doesn't matter, only the overall shape. So now they're going to match up uh, the yellow and the red. You see how the arrows are pointing the same way. So now we have a thing that's kind of like a cylinder, but with some holes in. And you're thinking, OK, how are we going to match up the remaining ones? Well, we're allowed to stretch and bend this weird cylinder thing like this. And then we will match up the edges with the arrows pointing the right way. And ta-da! <laughs> this is a double torus, also known as a double hollow donut. Um, and in topology, it's actually called a surface of genus 2. And as you might expect, if you think about maths and the way patterns work, um, you can also have a surface of genus 3 or genus 4, and indeed a surface of genus G, where G is any positive number, positive integer. Um, <laughs> and they can all be formed potentially in, in a similar way. Um, I love but that. I'm going to include something about that in the further reading if you want to kind of investigate further. I was watching chat and nobody guessed that that octagon was going to turn into a double donut. Nobody, no, nobody had, I, <laughs> nobody it, had it's that. quite amazing, really, isn't it? And um, when, when you see it, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, of course, the quotient space is a double donut. But if you showed me an octagon and said, if I match up the sides like this, what's it going to be? I don't think I even would have realised, you know? So, um, yeah. Somebody asked, what's the genus of a surface? I can't remember if we said that. OK. <laughs> um, sorry, I just briefly mentioned that. What I meant to say was uh, a surface of genus who means... Oh, it's uh, the video's going again. It means it has uh, two holes. Right. Let me just try and pause that. Um, it means it has two holes, basically. So, like, it has two donuts or two handles. So, if a surface um, is kind of like has three holes, kind of like a fidget spinner, um, with, with, you know, one, one of those ones that has three holes in a kind of triangle shape, um, that would be a surface of genus two because there's three holes running through it. It's like three yeah, handles, like if you like. One fewer than you expect for the number or something. It's like counting. It, it's weird how how much because we're deforming things. We already said it's kind of a joke that coffee mugs you can deform into a donut. Somehow, mm. lots of things you can deform into sort of donuts. Um, there's this kind of family. Yes, of, exactly. Like a yes, donut, and... a double donut, a triple donut, and you can't deform them into each other because kind of the number of holes through the donut is important. Um, yes. Yes, and if you do, in fact, study topology at university, which I did this term, um, <laughs> then you, you come to something called the classification of surfaces, which is basically classifying different surfaces that we can form and uh, classifying everything in terms of donuts and something else. And, like, everything is homeomorphic to either this or, or some other general constru uh, construction. Um, so, yeah, these, these donuts are really powerful. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the joke is that coffee cups are equivalent to donuts, that mathematicians can't tell yes. the difference between coffee cups and donuts. But then at university you discover that mathematicians can't tell the difference between anything and donuts. We think everything exactly. is donuts. <laughs> no, if you take one thing away from today, it's that everything really is just a donut at the end of the day. <laughs> Different number of holes. Right, okay. Um, yes, I think that's, that's a roundup of things people have said in chat. Brilliant, thank you. So what I'm going to... Um, do now is if it'll go on to the next slide okay here we go so uh, if you want to learn about more topology or read about more topology all of this is going to appear in the further reading so don't worry about um memorizing it now um firstly youtube um so here i at the side, it shows kind of suggested videos because I've been watching a lot of topology videos recently. Um, and you'll see that kind of everyone, your, all of your favourite maths YouTubers will have done something about topology if you want to learn more about it. There's a lot of videos about the Möbius strip, people saying different things about that. This is a video, what in the world is topological quantum matter, which I started watching the other day, very interesting. Uh, like I said at the beginning, you know, topology has links to um, physics and computer science and all kinds of things. If you want to get serious about learning some topology, you can look at a textbook. For example, Introduction to Metric and Topological Spaces by Sutherland. 
Um, and you may recognize that scary shape, the Klein bottle on the cover. Um, now, this textbook is one that's actually recommended to Oxford math students who are studying a topology course. So it might be quite advanced, but it does start off with some stuff which is kind of accessible um, in the first few chapters, I think. And there's also fun books. So uh, Flatterland here is my favorite book. It's just, it's brilliant. It's, it's both of these books. So Flatterland is a sequel to Flatland which is quite an old book. Both of them are called mathematical fiction because they explain mathematical concepts and stuff, but they also have like characters and storylines. Um, so, you know, it has a narrative. Um, Flatland is just about dimensions. It's about two dimensional world and then considering three dimensional world and four dimensional and high dimensions and all sorts of stuff. Uh, Flatterland considers loads more like different mathematical things. There's kind of a bit of physics as well. Um, but it has a chapter that's about topology featuring a, a Mobius band and um, lots of different things. There, you know, there are teacups that turn into donuts, all, all that kind of great stuff. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I would really recommend people read that. You go to a library, get a secondhand copy, whatever. Like, it's really enjoyable. Um, and then all that's left to say is thank you. And these are some topological memes. <laughs> Which hopefully, if you've been listening, you can now understand. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. Flora. That was brilliant. Um, there's a... <laughs> Someone in chat says Homer will be proud, I think, from all the donuts. Um, somebody... <laughs> somebody asked, what are the prerequisites of these books? And I think there's no prerequisites. For... Oh, yeah. So the textbook... Um... It, it might be a, a bit confusing until you kind of get into the first year of uni, but like if you want to be ambitious, you could look at the first few chapters and hopefully it would kind of explain, because it's an introduction to these topics, so hopefully it would explain stuff. Um, but like if, if you're kind of below A level, you're probably going to struggle if you start reading that. It's going to be a lot of terminology and symbols like straight away. Um, the fun books, like anyone can read them. You can read Flatland when, you know, you're like 11 years old and get something out of it um and the same with flatterland you know there, there is a story if you don't kind of pick up on all of the maths that's okay it's still a fun book i forgot that you had uh, memes are back <laughs> i forgot you had the textbook on the slide as well that one does have prerequisites of course yeah the, text, <laughs> the textbook i think it starts with kind of like set theory and symbols and stuff but you might have to keep googling stuff if you're trying to just read it without having started a university course real um i'm gonna read out some more things oh yeah someone's someone reminded me in chat flatland's the one so flatland's from a while ago i can't remember how old that book is yeah it's from like the victorian era um th there's lots more i could say about it like it's actually was partially written as a kind of satire on victorian society yeah. um it, <laughs> it all the men are different polygons with numbers of sides and the the greater the number of sides you have the higher status you have in society and then women are lines because they're like a lower class <laughs> um oh and someone says why are questions about non-integer genus being avoided because they're tricky <laughs> they're being avoided because that's not really a thing and when we when we define so i mean as far as i know when we define surface of genus g g is an integer like you you can have a topical, topological space with one hole, with two holes and three holes and so on. Um, you can't have half a hole. In topology, a hole goes in and it comes out. Like it goes all the way through. So, so. I guess I didn't answer the previous question because I'm really hesitant. Like I know that genus is normally defined to be an integer, but it's possible that someone's doing some really exciting cutting edge research that I haven't heard of. Yeah, where they're it, thinking it about could be a thing somewhere. Bizarre um, stuff. Um, I think the thing I like most about Flora's presentation is focusing on these quotienting um, to start with one space and to stick things together. Um, that turns out to be the right kind of uh, right kind of way structure. to understand. Yeah, the right structure for understanding. Yeah, um, and and if you do study maths at university, you will see quotient structures appearing everywhere, or especially in pure mathematics. You know, it's amazing. Does this, somebody <laughs> asks, does this chat have any moderators apart from Flora and James that I could speak to? Um, we're mostly. <laughs> we're, we're a very, I'm not. We're very I'm not moderating. 
You're not moderating today, say, Math Talk. I'm not moderating at the moment. If you think I could moderate the chat and do this at the same time, you're vastly overestimating me. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, apparently, I shouldn't be moderating chat and doing this at the same time because I forgot that bit where you showed them the Mobius strip. Um, Lucy says Lucy is in the school library and the Ian Stewart book is <laughs> near. <laughs> so that's exciting. It's course, near? Oh, that's in... brilliant. Read it. <laughs> In, in in topological terms, we're all close together, right? Because you can just deform the space between us until... Yeah, um, yeah, of course. Things space all between us together. means nothing. Distance um, is just a concept. Yeah, so I think there's a question that's just come in about, about Flatland. Was Flatland sexist or mocking sexism? And I think there's some... Oh, it's mocking sexism. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, like, from reading it... Um, the, the society which has like, you know, this terrible sexism where women are lines and they're treated as like a lower class. That is the society of Flatland, which is where the kind of protagonist lives originally, but they are taken out of that world and they discover other worlds. And I think the whole point of the story, if you like, is, oh, I'm just trapped in this flat society where everyone is has such a rigid view of everything. But actually there's other ways to think about stuff and it doesn't have to be like that. So yeah. And today's hottest question, well, not hottest question, but the most recent one is, are there equations and actual math in topology? <laughs> I promise there are. I haven't shown you loads today because it would be so complicated to kind of get into it. But there's loads of symbols. There's something called a word where you have letters representing different sides and then you like have a, a string of letters which represents a polygon. Um, so you, if you look up a topological word, that's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, you have algebra, like you can d define equivalence relations in terms of proper kind of set notation. Um, but I didn't do that because not everyone might have seen set notation and it would take me a while to kind of say, this means an element of, this is a set and so on. It'd be intersections and unions and that kind of thing. It, it, uh, it's a second year university course for a reason, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's the obligatory guest question, which I should have warned you about. It's what A levels did you do? If you're happy sharing. Oh, those. I don't mind this question. I actually love this question because what the A levels that I did were maths, further maths, um, religious studies, and Spanish. And everyone goes, oh, "You didn't do physics. Oh, you didn't do science subjects." And um, that's because the you know I did subjects that I was interested in at the time, and the only subjects which you need to do an Oxford maths degree are maths and further maths. And yes, you need A stars in them, and that's really hard. But for your other A-levels, you can do, you know, whatever you want, whatever you're interested in. And you won't get disadvantaged if you're doing three rather than four. Don't worry about that. Cool. Can you remember what grades we asked you to get in maths, further maths, religious studies and Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I had to get A-stars in maths and further maths. And then I had to get an A in one other subject. Now, some universities... Um, made offers to certainly my peer group, not me personally, which had four grades. So they said, okay, you're taking four A-levels, that means you have to get these four grades. Uh, whereas Oxford were nice <laughs> and said, you, you need to get three grades. So I, I actually did my, because um, of the kind of new linear courses, I did my A-level maths at the end of year 12. So I already had my A-star in maths. And so they made an offer to me based on the A-levels that I was sitting at the end of year 13 and it was, you have to get an A star in further maths and you have to get an A in one of the other two. So in theory, I could have just ditched one of my A levels, could have said, never mind Spanish, I'm not turning up. But I didn't, obviously, because I, I liked Spanish A level. And yeah, I, I, you know, I did all of them, got the A stars. Por supuesto, de Right, um, yes, okay. Um, great. Uh, oh, somebody asked what module you're doing at the moment. Should we keep, let's keep interviewing Flora. Um, I'm yeah. also gonna switch the slides over, if that's all right. Do you wanna talk yeah, about sure. which, which module you're doing? which modules I'm doing. Yeah, so, what are you up to at the moment? Uh, yeah, it, it's really interesting. So um, like someone might have mentioned previously, in the first year, all the content of, of the Oxford Master degree, is, oh, I need to stop screen sharing. I've replaced you with memes. Yeah. I'm really sorry. There we go. No, it's fine. <laughs> I'm here now. I'm back. <laughs> um, so in first year, everything's compulsory. In second year, we get quite a lot of choice. So this term recently, I've just been doing rings and modules, which is an abstract, abstract algebra course. Um, integration which has actually been like the theory behind integration um and then double integrals and other wacky stuff that you'll see at university um topology which is obviously this and a lot more stuff like this and like this but more complicated and like this but with more algebra <laughs> um and statistics um which is a course which i love 
you know, I, I really enjoyed that. Lots of hypothesis testing, but in a kind of proper rigorous mathematical way. Um, and then I also did a short course this term on um, integral transforms, which is a thing which is really useful in applied maths. And oh, someone's asked me how I prepared for the mat. So in my day, there did not exist James with his wonderful live stream. So what I did to prepare for the mat was I looked at past papers online and I kind of worked through them at home or talked to some friends about them. If you have, you know, mathematically minded friends, then you can talk to them um, and go through questions together. If you have teachers who are willing to help you, you can try and get them to talk to you about questions. That's really helpful. Uh, but honestly, just like Google, you know, further maths exercises. If you look at step resources, they can sometimes be helpful, even though steps slightly different. But yeah, look at past papers, very important. Is there any topology in first year? No, there isn't, um, because it kind of depends on stuff that we do in metric spaces, because it links to that. Metric spaces is the idea of like spaces that have distance. Um, so like, if you look, think about normal Euclidean space as an idea of distance between points, um, and we did that at the start of second year. How early did I start preparing for the mat? Uh, early? Well, probably like my preparation would have started in earnest in the summer because then you take it in October. Okay. Oh, that's really sweet. Whoever said I was nice. Thank you. <laughs> somebody <laughs> asked, yes. somebody was nice to you and somebody said, is James filling time to avoid getting Microsoft Paint up again? Which I thought was really rude. <laughs> I, I have, you know, so I've got slides. I've got slides behind here, but we're all having a nice time talking to Flora, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> why am I doing a mixture of pure and applied? Is that because why I like you're doing it. a mix? Oh, yeah. Someone said that, I think. It's disappeared <laughs> off the screen now. Um, I'm doing a mixture because I like it, and the Oxford Maths degree allows you to choose what you want, as long as um, you don't do vastly, wildly different things, which I'm not. I'm not really doing any kind of physics -y, fluids, applied dynamics stuff at the moment. What I am doing is a lot of pure maths, kind of integration, rings and modules, topology, and then I'm doing um, statistics. And last term I did probability. So going forward, I'm thinking of doing more kind of pure stuff like topology, like you know spaces, also algebra, group theory, um, but also probability and statistics. I'm allowed to kind of go into those two areas. Um, oh, someone said I'm lovely. Um, <laughs> is doing okay. questions the best way to revise maths? Yes, it is. Past papers are brilliant. Um. I think, so other than doing past papers, sometimes people ask, how do I prefer for math without doing past papers, just to build on that. And I think also doing other bits of random bits of maths is handy. Yeah, definitely. If you can find any kind of like further maths challenging problems online to get involved in, definitely. Which do I prefer, pure or applied? I prefer pure maths generally. Um, but then when you're talking about like probability and stats, I really like them as well. Am I not allowed to like both? let me like both um, i i will say that what's really interesting is the kind of intersection and where they link because when you get to second year um you can kind of start to see that in integration theory there's this thing called measure theory and measure spaces and in probability um you also have a probability measure where you measure different events and the probability of them and they actually link together so like for example there's a textbook which is about um measure and probability because everything that you do in measure spaces, which is a very pure topic, can be applied to probability. So what I'm saying is there is such a thing as pure probability and they link together. Okay. I'm going to sneakily steal the last 10 minutes of this to, to throw up a different different bit. Flora's, Flora's going to hang around? Are you going to hang around for the last 10 minutes? Yeah, of course I am. Yeah, okay. and whoever just said that stats is... Someone said stats is making them be sick. But what I want to say is it's not like stats at A-level. I didn't enjoy year 12 stats either. I am normal. Um, and what I will say is it starts gets a lot more interesting. It kind of becomes more like pure maths when you have kind of like rigorous definitions of stuff. Where do I plan on working? In a high school as a teacher. <laughs> it's abrate time. Um, and Here's an abrate. <laughs> cool. I'm gonna run an abrate. I'll take a breather. <laughs> you can, we can keep we keep we'll keep doing chat as well. But I want to throw my abrate up just because. I found an abrate that's related to what you talked about, Flora. Um, that's so brilliant. Here's the, here's the link. Um, topolo topological glue is a bit like adding spaces together. So I found this question. Um, what happens if you stick two Mobius strips together along their edge? So they only have one edge. So what happens if you take two of them and stick them together along their edge? 
um, which I thought would be a fun uh, fun ad break problem. And then I realised it's really hard and I don't know how you would approach it. Um, <laughs> the answer, which I'm not going to explain now, but the answer is a Klein bottle. Um, so that weird four-dimensional embedding shape thing that Flora showed you yes. earlier. If you glue, if you add, add two together, not quite a donut. donut, um, <laughs> something weirder than a donut. Cool, I like this. So this is Mobius plus Mobius equals Klein bottle. Welcome to the Oxford Maths yeah. live stream. It's an alternative ad break, really. Uh, has anyone asked you? Has anyone asked yeah, you a question I answer, in the chat? Yeah, I answer Go these on. questions. So, someone <laughs> said, "Did you get advice about which courses to choose in second year based on what you're interested in?" Uh, yeah, basically, yes, I did. Um, you can talk to your tutors in your college that you know they're generally quite approachable, and you can chat to them about like what maths you've enjoyed so far and what you'd like to do going forward. But also. Um, all the course materials, so like the lecture notes are available on the maths course website so I can read them like when I'm trying to decide whether I want to take that course, which is helpful. Um, and someone asked me about UKMT challenges. Yes, I did UKMT challenges, um, the, the single ones, and I did a team one once when I was in sixth form. I and we we didn't get very far, but it was fun. <laughs> it tells you how long it's been, how long it's been running. I did a team maths challenge back in the day yeah. um cool how uh, to add real numbers <laughs> <laughs> okay okay um what have i got so i've got one problem i kind of want to show them this random unrelated problem but yeah i'm not sure okay Go right i'm going to show them a problem i'll show them a problem I won't explain what the answer is run a bit of maths and then yes yeah. on your comment though you so you said something about you had a look at the courses in you had a look at the courses coming up um, yes. I've been thinking about making, we've got information for people on the course, I've been thinking about making a more detailed guide to courses for prospective applicants or for people yeah, in school. Yeah, that, that would be really, handy. yeah, that would be really interesting, I think. Like when I was going, looking around, going to open days at different universities, you know, topology was something which kind of drew me in, in terms of like, they would give you a taster and say, haha, look, a mug is like a donut. Um, and I was like, wow, that's cool. Um, and then... Um, you would hear a bit about what courses but just the titles of the courses don't mean that much until you kind of get to uni so yeah I think there is a document which exists uh, uh, that explains the courses a bit someone's asked me about work experience I'll just briefly say I did work experience in a high school in Manchester so I was helping out in the math department and helping people in math lessons <laughs> Maya wants the guide to courses. That's all the nudge I needed. I'm going to make a guide to courses. Um, yeah, actually, doing, it will. It will happen. Doing the maths club has shown me that you can with with the audience here. People are quite keen for like more detail about maths. That we can do more than just saying you're going to learn courses with these names. Like Flora can show you some actual topology from the topology. Yeah, like course. this is stuff that actually happened in my second year course. You know. Cool. Right. I'm going to leave them with one problem uh, that's unrelated to everything, just because. I made the slides just in case we needed them. And it looks like we don't need them, but you know, I've got them anyway. Um... Sorry, everyone keeps asking me questions. I just keep going on. <laughs> I'm fighting myself because I want them. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> I also want to use my slides. Um, so the idea is um, of looking at random graphs. It's something I've been reading about it lately. Um, the idea behind a random graph is you have some vertices and you either join two vertices together or you don't. You think about every possible edge and you either draw it in or you don't. You have probability P to draw that particular edge, independent, every edge. Um, and you ask fun questions like, what's the probability that the graph you get when you draw edges, probability P, what's the probability that's connected? What's the expected size for the largest connected component? Things like that. You ask about graph properties um, where all the edges only exist with probability P. Um, there's a way to think about that of, or a kind of characterization that people sometimes use to imagine these as like, um, like a road network joining towns up. Um, so here I've got four towns in the corner, in the corners, and they're joined up by roads. Um, there's a kind of bridge in the middle, so these roads don't don't touch. Um, <laughs> they're joined up by roads, and each road could have like roadworks on with probability one minus p, um, or be open with probability p. And then this question like, can you get if some of the roads are closed, each road's closed with probability p, can you get from each town to each other town. Is the network still, maybe you can't go direct, but maybe the network still works. Um, and this problem turns out to be quite sort of, quite approachable with stuff you know from A-level math, sort of combinatorics, counting problems, um, probability stuff. Um, it's sort of probability, it's sort of just counting. 
Um, yeah. So thinking about um, thinking about all the possibilities of well, maybe that road's closed, but I'll still be able to get between any pair of towns by going via the the bridge in the middle or something. It's a little bit Königsberg, except um, Königsberg Königsberg bridge problem. You have to you have to visit all of them without repeating roads. I don't mind if you repeat roads here. Yeah, it looks kind of similar. <laughs> if there's if there's only like if there's only like the roads around the outside left, then that's fine. You can, I guess in that case you can visit all of them. Um, yeah, so sort of a way to approach this might be if you want to sort of hint, um, then a way to approach this might be to think about um, how many roads are open. Um, if I have these probability p of each road being open. Um, so I might try and break it into cases like that. It feels like an approach to me. Um, if you do that, then it turns out that um, there are different cases in each case. So if, if different cases in each case. So if, if one or two roads are open, it's not connected. You, you, you're in trouble. Some of, the, some of the towns are cut off. Um, if three roads are open, it's complicated and there's different cases. Um, I'm telling you this because it's a hint that I can give you, but you've still got to go and do work if you want to work this out. Um, I'll put a kind of clean statement of the problem in the further reading. Um, this is something I've been reading about recently. Um, there's an amazing result that for I've got four towns. If you've got a large number of towns, um, this is a fact by Erdős from Rainey in 1960. Um, with a large number of towns, if the probability of a road being open is less than log n over n, so some number depending on the number of towns, number of vertices n, um, then it's almost certainly disconnected. And if the probability is even slightly, just a little bit bigger than log n over n, then it's almost certainly connected. It just switches. Yeah, that's amazing. That point, from being definitely not connected, yeah, no chance, to suddenly, oh yeah, certainly connected at that particular probability. Wow. Um, that's the sort of important switching over probability. It turns out lots of, lots of random graph theory questions have this kind of surprising answer where mm. the thing is one answer or very suddenly switches to the other answer. Um, at some particular point. Uh, more in the further reading. Um, and uh, and it's sort of like someone says Sterling's approximation, and I'll give them credit for uh, thinking of approximations or thinking of yeah. um, how even, even when you've got large N, you can say sort of approximations about things. You can say what's likely to happen. You, know, you might know about things like the central limit theorem, describing what happens to you. Very yeah, I was just there. thinking this idea of almost yeah. certainly reminds me of uh, yes. something in probability I saw, which was like almost surely. Um, so I wanted to throw this in because I read about it recently and I thought I've got to tell, yeah, I've got cool. to tell the math club, um, <laughs> got to tell <laughs> OMC. Um, uh, yeah, okay. What do I want to do? Oh, and I want to plug a thing. Um, I've been asked by oh further reading on the website. <laughs> I've been asked by myself to plug the uh, the further reading on the website. <laughs> um, Flora's got some stuff on topology. I've got a random graph problem. <laughs> I've yep. managed to crowbar in in between answering, asking questions. Um, Maya wants to know where I come across new topics, which is a really good question. Um, and somebody yeah. earlier asked about EPQ suggestions. Um, I've been... Mm. So I've been looking to math world quite a lot in the further reading, and I've been exploring around math world, which is kind of maths encyclopedia. It's mostly way too technical for me. Um... <laughs> So I've been linking very carefully to bits of MathWorld um, for OOMC. But I've been trying to grab random bits of maths. I've been looking at, for this kind of explain the courses kind of thing I might make, I've been looking at the Oxford courses and trying to trying to find yeah. bits and pieces, looking through what's in our university course and trying to find things. Uh, almost certainly means that uh, infinitely many, but not necessarily all. Yes, because there's, there's some, even if probability is really high of having a road, then you, you can still get unlucky and have all the roads be closed. That's sort of vanishingly unlikely if you have yeah. loads of if, if loads of towns, then the probability that like all the roads are closed, well, probably not. Um, no matter what your probability is, but yeah, that that possibility does still exist. So it have to be like quite much mm. almost. Um, I have got a plug. I've got an ad for um, an essay competition. Um, so a colleague of mine uh, called Tom Rocks Maths um, has got this essay competition called Teddy Rocks Maths um, with St Edmund Hall. Um, which is one of the colleges at Oxford. Um, it's an essay competition. It's open to anyone. Um, you can write about any mathematical topic you choose. Um, there's cash prizes. One of them is just for people aged under 18 um, or equal to 18. Uh, entries close end of next week. Um, even if you don't enter um, at the website, which I'll put in uh, the further reading links, um, at the website, there are a couple of the winning essays from last year, if you want to just read other people's maths essay. One of them's on Penrose tiling. Um, which is a nice intro to that. We all like Penrose Tiling. Yeah. Do you need to write essays in uni? Um, not like this. 
I think it's probably fair unless you want to. Depends what course you do, but if you do maths, you won't have to until you get to master's level where you have to do a dissertation. Cool. Brilliant. Um, I think we've filled up... Uh, oh, somebody wants to know, is anybody else doing St John's Study Day on Monday? And I'm doing the St, jo- I'm doing the St. John's Study Day on Monday, so <laughs> nice. I'll see you there. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Um, Flora, do you want to say anything else? I've kind of been talking for 10 minutes. Someone asked about an EPQ in maths, so I was just going to say, I did an EPQ in maths, and um, I, when I went to interview at Oxford, it gave me something to talk about, because I had done lots of reading of maths books for my EPQ, so it kind of made me do maths research and have further reading to talk about, so I think it is a valuable exercise. Oxford definitely doesn't require an EPQ, though. We no, know that no one's no. got the chance to do one. And some people have the chance to do an EPQ, but then don't have the chance to do it on something mathsy or something that they're, they're really Yeah, it, it doesn't in. matter. It's just good to read around stuff. Everyone wants to know what the St John's Study Day is now. Um, it's <laughs> like this. We're going to do some We're gonna do some maths. Um, it's organised by St John's. There was a Somerville one as well recently. I put the link, links in the thing. Uh, does James do all the interviews? Yeah, it feels like it. No, not really. <laughs> right? I do think one person could possibly do all the interviews. They have to be like Santa. A lot of people have interviews. Um, the to- topic of my EPQ was dimensions and like thinking about higher dimensions. And it it began from kind of me reading the book Flatland and thinking about like higher dimensions and how we could visualize them. Somebody else wants to know where you get your memes from. I'm not gonna lie. I googled it. I googled topology memes, and they came up, and I understood them, and I thought, yeah, it'd be fine. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Right, I think we're gonna wrap up the live segment of the Oxford Online Maths Club bit here. But don't forget to check the further reading for more stuff from Flora and a little bit of stuff from me. Um, I'll see you in 167 hours for another episode of the Oxford (laughs) Online Maths Club. We've got two more in this season. We've got episode 11 and 12. Then we're taking a break for the Easter holidays. uh, And then we'll be back after that for season two. Uh, But right now, I suppose, thanks again to Flora. Um, Thank you. Thanks to Jonah and Beth, uh, who have been moderating chat and answering some of the questions. Um, And we'll see you next week. Bye.